February 26, 1944. We've seen the Germans bomb European cities. We've seen the Brits, the Americans, and the Soviets do it too. What if they do it all at once? That happens this week. This is Big Week. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the second and third week of February 1944, the fractured French resistance was finally unifying under a central command. The Royal Air Force broke out dozens of French resistance members by bombing the prison they were being held in in Amiens. In the British House of Lords, a debate about the morality of strategic bombing flared up, in the midst of which the Allied forces in Italy destroyed the millennium-old monastery at Monte Cassino. In Lithuania and Greece, the anti-communist resistance entered into tentative cooperation agreements with their German occupiers. In Poland, the Home Army ramped up Operation Tempest to fight the German occupiers, while the US declared neutrality in the Polish-Soviet border dispute. This week, it is British Prime Minister Winston Churchill who very publicly returns to the Polish question. Now, on the 21st, Churchill messages Stalin that the Polish government in exile is ready to accept the Kherson line. Like US President Franklin Roosevelt last week, he tries to convince Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin to accept an independent Polish government. Churchill reassures the Soviet top dog that by the time diplomatic relations are restored, the Polish government will consist of members willing to cooperate with Moscow. Stalin remains unconvinced. The next day, Churchill holds a speech in the House of Commons, publicly proclaiming support for the Soviet border demands, misrepresenting Stalin's position. It was with great pleasure that I heard from Marshal Stalin that he too was resolved upon the creation and maintenance of a strong, integral, independent Poland as one of the leading powers in Europe. I am convinced that they represent the settled policy of the Soviet Union. Four days later, the Polish government in exile goes against Churchill wishes and rejects Soviet demands that the Kherson line shall be Poland's eastern frontier. In the Far East, the events of a post-war future are also being prepared, but here the issue is how to handle the enemy after they have been defeated. The United Nations Alliance has set up bodies to handle investigations and prosecutions of Axis war crimes, but China is lagging behind. Almost a year ago, in March 1943, the Kuomintang Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs made a list of war crimes and made them subject to mandatory investigation. They requested military commanders and provincial governments to report the crimes. The task proved to be difficult and there was no body set up to handle investigations. On February 23rd, that changes when a war crimes investigation committee with members from several ministries is formed. The committee will coordinate and lead investigations conducted by the provincial and municipal governments of China and selected military commanders in each war zone. The investigations will effectively bring together all levels of the Guomintang Nationalist Party and the current Chinese court system in cooperation. But it will not involve the Chinese Communist Party and it will only investigate crimes by the Japanese enemy. As past Axis crimes come under more and more investigation, there seems to be no end to new Axis crimes to investigate. In Auschwitz, on February 23rd, a train arrives with several hundred Jews from the Weivara concentration camp near Narva. Weivara is the biggest of the 22 Nazi camps in occupied Estonia. When the ghettos in Vilnius and Kovno were liquidated last year, some of those not murdered in the liquidation ended up here. Until now, their fate was undecided. At Auschwitz, they are murdered on arrival. On this day, the Nazis make no record of the names and numbers of people killed. They simply herd them into the gas chambers to an anonymous death. Two days later, a transport from Vienna arrives with a variety of prisoners. Among them are 41 Austrians of Jewish ethnicity. The non-Jewish prisoners and 16 of the able-bodied Jews are enslaved, and the youngest and oldest 25 are murdered. The next day, a transport from Fossoli, Italy, brings 650 Jewish Italian men, women, and children, and another train brings 64 Polish Jewish men until now enslaved at the Sostomitz concentration camp. The 134 deemed to be the healthiest are enslaved, and 580, the elderly, the ailing or weak, pregnant women, and children too young to work, are murdered. While that clockwork of death continues to tick, a crescendo of bombs from all sides rain down on European cities. 
The Germans continued their renewed retribution attacks on Great Britain, mainly London. This week, the Luftwaffe is more successful at bringing death and destruction than in previous weeks. Since last night of last week, they are bombing London nightly. Now, during the Blitz of 1941, the Germans were using a more targeted approach than the RAF, with dive bombers playing a significant part. The RAF, on the other hand, have used mainly area or carpet bombing with significantly more effect but less precision. The Germans have now adopted the same tactic but with far fewer bombers than the British can deploy. In the night into February 21st, for the first time, most of the bomber stream manages to converge over London. The raid ignites 480 fires. 179 civilians are killed immediately, 65 reported missing are also presumed dead, and 484 are seriously injured. Destruction is widespread, with interrupted underground services, cut water mains and blocked streets, and over 200 houses damaged. The next night they come again. This time they cause many more fires. The boroughs of Fulham, Putney and Chiswick bear the brunt of the attack. Fulham alone is hit by 20,000 incendiary bombs causing 642 fires. Later calculations will show that had the RAF failed to divert a few less or not shoot down all of the nine bombers they did, a firestorm would likely have erupted here. The government quarters at Westminster is hit by four heavy bombs. One on Whitehall kills four people on the corner of 10 Downing Street. Horse Guards Parade, St. James Park, the Admiralty and the War Office are damaged. Six bombs hit the Grange at South Mims, where Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands' residence in exile is situated. Her Majesty narrowly escapes being hit, but two of her staff are killed. The raid causes 216 dead and 417 seriously injured. The night going into February 23rd, the Luftwaffe drop 81 tons of bombs on London and 75 tons on Essex and Kent. Around 230 fires erupt and 29 people die. The next night, the code name for the operation is Hamburg, and the intended target is the London Docks. The bombs fall mainly on the town of Colchester, though, where 1,400 incendiaries start a connected fire in multiple properties in the town centre. It takes 75 fire engines and 2 million gallons of water to extinguish the flames. Miraculously, there is only one injured and no fatalities on the ground. In the night into February 25th, the target is the government quarter at Westminster. The Germans send in 170 planes. Many bombs do fall on Westminster, but despite new supposedly better bomb sites, the bombs are also scattered to many places. The building housing General Dwight Eisenhower's Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, where the invasion of Normandy is being planned, barely escapes being hit. In all, some 250 fires erupt and 75 people are killed. Now, that, this here, is the ninth raid of Operation Steinbock. 129 German bombers have been lost, as well as dozens of escorting fighters. Hundreds of airmen are dead or captured, numbers that the Luftwaffe can't sustain over time. Like all the raids by any side in the war so far, despite the terror it inflicts, the damage it does, and the people it kills, the Germans have achieved little to nothing to move the dial in the actual war. Well except keeping their own air force and that of the enemy busy being destroyed and dying and making the people at home feel that at least something is being done to punish the enemy. This week, the US Army Air Force is determined to break that status quo as they go after German air power in Big Week. Operation Argument, Big Week, is a six-day campaign to undermine German aircraft production. Karl Spotts, commander of the US Air Force in the combined bombing campaign, has postponed the operation several times due to poor weather. But this week, the skies are clearer. To avoid the previous disastrous losses, the fighter escorts' ranges have been extended with drop tanks, formation training has been intensified, and the attack patterns altered. It begins on February 20th, when they come down on 12 major targets in Rostock, Braunschweig, Leipzig, and a half dozen other smaller towns. Only 15 of 880 bombers and four escorting fighters are lost. However, the Luftwaffe soon learned the new patterns of attack and, for unknown reasons, escorts lapse later in the week, leading to a total of 158 lost planes for the 8th and 89 for the 15th Air Force by week's end. 
only 28 American fighters are lost, while the Luftwaffe will lose one-third of its single-engine fighters during February and almost one-fifth of its fighter crews. Planes the Germans can't replace fast enough. The USAAF, on the other hand, have almost twice as many P-51 Mustang fighters on hand by the end of the week than they had at the beginning. So one might think that the raids are a raging success. Well, this is how Richard Overy analyzes the situation in his book, The Bombing War in Europe. The damage sustained by the German aircraft industry was difficult for the Allies to gauge, not least because air intelligence estimates of German production by this stage of the war greatly understated the reality. The Ministry of Economic Warfare estimates of German fighter production for the first half of 1944 was 655 a month, whereas the reality was 1,581 and rising steadily. The aero engine industry, more difficult to disperse and more vulnerable, was not attacked, a failure that Göring later pointed out to his post-war interrogators. The attacks accelerated the further dispersal of the industry and prompted a program for underground construction in which aircraft had a priority. A planned 48 million square meters of floor space out of a provisional total of 93 million. Output nevertheless continued to increase rapidly despite the bombing, which has encouraged the view that Operation Argument effectively failed. What the operation succeeds to do, though, is kill a lot of civilians. Arthur Harris, RAF Bomber Command, is flying parallel missions. Although he has previously refused to target industry primarily, he does try this week. It doesn't work, and he again hits mostly civilian targets. The worst raid is over Augsburg in the night into February 26. 60% of the city is destroyed. Casualty raids for civilians, POW, and forced laborers are not tallied for the specific raids as it is by now hard to assign them to one definitive event. Reasonable estimates range from several hundred, possibly thousands of dead. The worst incident for the Americans happens on February 22nd. On this day, a lot of things go wrong. Many planes fail to take off and even more get recalled due to unexpected low cloud cover over Germany. As they return, they are attacked by the Luftwaffe. The weather, the attacking fighters, and the general confusion disperses them. The standing order is that if the intended target is abandoned, they must look for targets of opportunity. The bombers that had reached Germany now try to unload their bombs on railroad junctions, train stations, and factories on their way back. Now, in the chaos, they don't know exactly where they are, and the targets are only identified visually. They mistakenly assume that they are still over Germany. Instead, they are bombing Nijmegen, Arnhem, Deventer, and Enschede in the Netherlands. They hit mostly residential areas, killing 40 in Enschede, 57 in Arnhem, and 880 in Nijmegen. Countless more are injured, 1,270 buildings are destroyed, leaving several thousand families homeless. The next day, the weather is still poor, and operations are suspended as an investigation is launched into the previous day's tragedy. The Dutch government in exile and the U.S. Embassy quickly agreed that it's a tragic operational mistake. The German occupiers in the Netherlands seize on the propaganda opportunity, having the Nazi-controlled Dutch press publish things like this. The Anglo-American pirates of the sky have once again executed the orders of their Jewish capitalist leaders with extraordinarily positive results. Now, while these raids have some kind of success, for better or worse, the massive raids the Soviet Union is carrying out against their Finnish enemy in February 1944 are a complete bust. In the last night of this week, the Soviet Air Force, the VVS, carry out their third and final attack of the month on Helsinki. 896 bombers come in three waves, dropping thousands of bombs. The Soviets are convinced that they have now destroyed the city, killed hundreds, perhaps thousands of civilians, and that the Finns will thereby be forced to the negotiating table. They are mistaken. As the Soviet-led military commission visiting Helsinki shortly after the war will note in astonishment, in all these raids, the VVS have consequently missed the capital, dropping most of their bombs in the wilderness. Of the 5,182 bombs dropped in the final raid, only 290 fall on the city. The civilians are mostly evacuated since long, and any people remaining are warned over 90 minutes ahead of time thanks to effective radar monitoring. Instead of thousands killed, the combined death toll for the three raids is in the dozens. 
While they fail here, the Soviets succeed in the complete cleansing of two entire ethnicities this week. In 1940, the Checheno-Ingush ASSR, part of the Russian SFSR, inspired by the Finnish resistance to the Red Army in the Winter War, brothers Hassan and Hussein Israilov launched an insurgency against the Soviet government. The 451,000 people of Chechen and Ingush ethnicities make up 65% of the ASSR population. Another 30,000 live outside of the ASSR. They have all faced suppression of their culture and Islamic religion by the communists since the Russian Revolution. After Barbarossa, the Israelov brothers proclaimed the provisional popular revolutionary government of Chechen Ingushetia. By the end of the summer of 41, their militia counted 5,000 combatants, with 25,000 civilians in support. So 6.6% of the Chechen and Ingush population rebelled against Soviet oppression. The Israelovs set up strict discipline and guidelines for how to operate with the goal to fight the NKVD and their helpers, but not drag undefended civilians into the fight. The campaign that Moscow launches to fight the rebels was far less surgical, including carpet bombing and reprisal killings of the uninvolved. In early 1942, Marbek Sheripov raised another militia, and the total number of rebels reached 60,000, including supporters, many of whom had deserted from the Red Army after seeing reprisals against their neighbors and families. Sheripov's and the Israelov's joint goal became to unite several nascent ethnic rebellions in the Caucasus to achieve independence and freedom from communism for each ethnicity. Now, the, the Nazi-led invasion into the Caucasus only barely reached the checheno ingush ASSR. The only town seized by the German forces was Malgobek, which had a majority of Russian ethnic inhabitants. The capital, Grozny, remained behind the front lines. Negotiations did take place between Sheripov and the Germans, but nothing came of it because, as Sheripov told the Germans, if the liberation of the Caucasus meant only the exchange of one colonizer for another, the Caucasians would consider this only a new stage in the National Liberation War. In the end, only 100 Chechens collaborated with the Nazis. Now, after the Germans retreated, it is time for the Soviets to quell the rebellion once and for all. Well, to be exact, it is time to eliminate the supposedly Nazi collaborationist checheno ingush ASSR altogether. Leading the charge as head of the NKVD Leverenti Beria in direct coordination with Stalin. In their communication, we can see the true motives. Beria tells the dictator that the Chechens have a low level of labor discipline, that there is prevalence of banditry and terrorism, alludes to the failure of the Chechens to join the Communist Party, and points to the confession of a German agent that he found a lot of supporters among the local Ingush. In the past month, Beria has moved 100,000 NKVD operatives into the ASSR, ostensibly to provide humanitarian aid. Many of them are housed on friendly terms with the very families they are about to go after. On February 20th, Beria personally comes to Grozny to oversee Operation Lentil. Three days later, February 23rd, is Red Army Day, and the operation begins. Going house to house, they force the families to pack their belongings in only 20 to 30 minutes. When the NKVD meets resistance, they respond with slaughter, like in the All of Kaibach, where some 700 people are locked in a barn and burned to death by NKVD General Mikhail Jevishiani, who receives praise and the promise of a medal from Beria. In remote villages, the entire population is killed on Beria's orders as they are considered too cumbersome to transport, as are those straggling or left behind when the transports are full. They combed the huts to make sure there was no one left behind. The soldier who came into the house did not want to bend down. He raked the hut with a burst from his submachine gun. Blood trickled out from under the bench where a child was hiding. The mother screamed and hurled herself at the soldier. He shot her too. There was not enough rolling stock. Those left behind were shot. The bodies were covered with earth and sand carelessly. The shooting had also been careless, and people started wriggling out of the sand like worms. The NKVD men spent the whole night shooting them all over again. 
In less than a week, the NKVD round up the entire Chechen and Ingush population. In the first day alone, 176,950 people are loaded onto Studebaker US 6 trucks and taken to the unheated and uninsulated freight cars. The 180 trains will run until March 13th and travel over 3,000 kilometers to discharge their human cargo into desolate areas of Central Asia, devoid of shelters or food. Most end up in the Kazakh SSR, a large number in the Kyrgyz SSR, and a lesser number of deportees in the Uzbek SSR, Russian SFSR, and Tajik SSR. In all, 478,479 Chechens, Ingush, and Russian women married to Chechen or Ingush men are removed. Half of the deported are children. Many die on the trains, others of exposure and starvation in their desolate new homes. Up to 150,000, almost a third of the Chechen and Ingush, have already died or will die prematurely in the coming weeks and months. Seventy years later, one of the young children, Isa Khashyaev, will remember his deportation and arrival in Kokhshatsu in the Kazakh SSR. We had no water and no food. The weak were suffering from hunger, and those who were stronger would get off the train and buy some food. Some people died on the way, no one in our carriage, but in the next carriage I saw them taking out two corpses. Our baby sister died the same night we arrived. My dad was looking for a place to bury her. He found a suitable place, dug the grave, and buried her. She must have frozen to death. Never forget. (laughs) 